It is February 2019, and back with me, I have oh, someone who hasn't been here since last year. It's been so long. Last yeah, year? I think, uh, I think it was last year. So to be fair, January of a new year always feels like a whole year in and of itself. Yeah, we had state testing. So I'm so sure... Long. I'm sure it uh, felt extra long due to January just being itself. It's been an entire year change since you were on. It's like, own it. Own it. Oh, my. <laughs> but, uh, new year, new me. Never. Sorry. And we have a great guest today. New we have year, a, same an me. author. It's been a while since we've had an author on the show, uh, a couple months. And uh, this is one that's written a lot of stuff that I have read, but you know of, right? Yes. You know, I grew up, as many people can't tell, I list, I read a lot of Forgotten Realms and Magic the Gathering books and so on. That's why they're on the show all the time. I did not. But. Not not for lack of not wanting to, though. But I hope this interview is at least uh, something that you will definitely love. And uh, so on that note, let's, um, let's have uh, our wonderful Zach give us the epic intro that this guest deserves. The waves may whisper, but the portents howl. The realms may call themselves forgotten, but the Thanatarium remembers. And as the great heaving heft of Baldur's Gate parts rays of fantastical magic pour forth to illuminate our hallowed halls and announce the arrival of none other than Mr. Philip Athens, our esteemed guest has penned two novelizations of Baldur's Gate, has no less than eight novels to his name, and his guiding hand has helped to shape dozens more. Mr. Athens has a long and, dare we say, storied career penning and editing tales spun in the annals of the dearly beloved fantasy genre, including Greyhawk, Dark Matter, Star Drive, and dungeons and dragons. And we here at the Thanatarium wish him only more. So join us, Mr. Athens, that we may bring your writerly voice to the willing ears of our fans. Do us the honor of your company and conversation. And above all else, welcome to the Thanatarium. So with that, welcome to the show, Mr. Athens, or as we're going to call you from now on, Phil. Um, yes. It's an honor to have you here. As, a, as I've read a lot of your works from the 90s to now. Well, well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. So, you know, a lot of people know you for writing fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, you've taught people how to write as well. Um, and, you know, people know you for Baldur's Gate uh, novelizations. Oh, for, I hope not. Well, <laughs> they know of you for those ones. Uh, Forgotten Realms in general, you've done as, you've done editing, a lot of editing with the Forgotten Realms. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if anyone who's listened to the show for a long time, we love the Forgotten Realms. We've had hey. so many people from Elaine Cunningham to Salvatore to uh, Richard Breyer to Ed Green. You know, we, we, we love we love talking to realms. And that's Great. an honor to have you. So Thanks. So uh, I guess I'm just going to uh, start at the beginning. Um, so I know I, I've read a lot of your stuff where you talk about how you were majorly influenced growing up um, fiction wise reading old Marvel comics, uh, mm -hmm. Starlog magazine and, um, and Star Trek. So I'm just really curious, you know, growing up with those, what led you growing up with Marvel, Starlog, Star Trek into writing fantasy, like straight up fantasy? Yeah, so... Really, I was two years old when Star Trek came on for the first time. So I'm I'm old. I'm an old man. I was born in 1964, so I don't. I really don't remember. And I think you know this is obviously true for a lot of people now. Don't remember a world without Star Trek in it. It was just there all the time. But you know, also having been born in the mid 60s or early 60s. I grew up in the middle of the space program as well. So there was really a sense that the future was happening and it was going to be awesome and it was going to be space and it was going to be jetpacks and stuff like that. Right. And, and that just latched onto my imagination from as long ago as I could remember. 
and I just was a, I don't know that I knew the words science fiction, but was a fan from forever. And, you know, just like everybody does, it's certainly everybody in that pre-internet era, you go to school and you meet people. And I, you know, met this kid when I was in elementary school who had a comic book and it was a Fantastic Four comic book. And I remembered them from the old animated series that was pretty obscure, and but I kind of vaguely remembered that. And he let me borrow that and I read through it and I was just floored. It was, that was it, right? I just, that bug had bit me and I got into Marvel Comics right at what I still believe is the absolute height of, of their output right in that sort of early mid seventies or early seventies to late seventies. Um, and one of the things that Marvel was always really good at was cross promoting themselves. So in every issue of fantastic four and Spider-Man and stuff that I was reading, they would talk about the other stuff coming out. And one of them was Conan and I didn't, didn't understand what that was, but bought one. And I thought, what is this? This is cool. This is weird. It's not part of the, he's not in New York. It's not part of the Marvel universe, but they were also very good about crediting Robert E. Howard as, you know, the source of the character and the source of some of the stories. And I thought, well, I should just maybe try to find one of these and read the original stories. And that was it. Then it was just fantasy for me. And that's how I, you know, came into fantasy was through that, the pulp sword and sorcery stuff, as opposed to, I think most people from my generation kind of came in through the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And, you know, now people are coming in through Harry Potter. Yeah, so but you my from the Solomon Kane Conan type yeah. of versus the, yeah. Nice. Yeah. And, and so when, and, and then, you know, I started reading, I was reading analog magazine. I got my parents to get me a subscription to that. And there was always an ad for a game called met or a company called, I think it was called meta gaming at the time that I think later morphed into Steve Jackson games. And they had advertised these micro games that were science fiction board games. And I thought, wow, that's cool. Like, <laughs> is there such a thing as this? And you know, ordered some of those through the mail and had a friend, we would just sit there endlessly and play those. And they were, you know, games like Ogre and Annihilation. There was just a bunch of them. Um, and one of them was called The Fantasy Trip. And it was kind of a, it was sort of a role-playing game. It started as a, as a, you know, kind of a, you were gladiators in an arena and it was sort of a combat game. Nice. Um, and then my friend said, well, I heard of this Dungeons and Dragons. I'm going to get that. And so I was like, yeah, let's go. Like, we were just looking for any science fiction fantasy game we could find. And so that was the summer of 1978, the summer right before we started high school. Um, and he got the basic set, which was the one with the blue book in it. So you're older. Uh, listeners will know what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> the very, very much older listeners. Um, and we sat down and, and tried to figure it out, right, with no one to teach us, you know, no one to sort of bring us into the fold, just reading through the that blue rule book and just rolled up a character, just three dice in order, you know. And I had my highest score was an intel was an intelligence. So he said, Well, you should be a magic user then. I'm like, awesome. That sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. So it took us a while to figure out how to read a four-sided die that came in the box. But once we got that together, I rolled it and for hit points, and I got a one. And I said, well, that can't be right, right? Because doesn't that mean that if anything just hits me once, I just die? And we kind of poured through the rule book, and he said, that, no, that can't be right. Well, let's just go, and let's, we'll just try it and see, because that can't be right. <laughs> so we go into the first dungeon and it's just a stairway and you go down a hallway and then there's a wandering monster skeleton. One skeleton comes out. We roll for initiative. The skeleton wins the initiative. It hits me because I have no armor. And it's, I think the damage was every, all of the damage in that set was one D six and it rolled like a three or something. And, and as far as we could tell, I died. That was just it. Like I walked down the stairs, the skeleton no. charged at me and killed me. 
And my initial reaction was, this game sucks. <laughs> this, this, this game is stupid. Well, and I spent all that time making your character and then dead. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was it. Like, for the rest of the summer, we just didn't even play it again. And then met some, you know, guys in our art class. Like, how nerdy is this? And our freshman, you know, year high school art class who had really been playing D&D and understood, like, how you know, not to just be a first level magic user with one hit point by yourself and think anything's good. You know, that you're going to play for more than a couple of minutes. And they kind of got, they really got us into it. But so when I really started playing in earnest, the dungeon master's guide wasn't even out yet. We were finding pieces of it that they were publishing as excerpts and dragon. So I went back to, I went to, you know, started with D and D almost at the very beginning. Nice. Oh my gosh. And, uh, you know, it's interesting now you were talking about, you know, Conan with Marvel and all these ones. You know, a lot of the comics that Marvel made in the 70s, they didn't make due to Dark Horse and so on for so long. But I believe Marvel just got back Conan, just like they just got mm -hmm. back Star Wars and all these ones they published <laughs> in yeah. the late 70s and so on. And so, like, Marvel's kind of going back to some of the roots, though, of course, Conan publication is probably going to change a bit because Dark Horse has taken in a, a bit different direction than they've had for a while. But it's, it's kind of nice mm -hmm. to see all these things going back. Uh, yeah. To to Marvel, and it and also it's just I mean and and a character that just will not go away. That's just a character that will not die. That you know obviously goes from you know whose origins go way back before those comic books were ever um, published, even in the seventies. So this is you know these were stories written in the twenties and thirties. Yeah, and you know there's even uh, multiple games, uh, computer games and so on coming out this year too. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting, and they've always talked about more movies and. You know, they'll probably eventually make yeah. them. It's, it's it's interesting. It's also interesting how, you know, I grew up with uh, with Robert Howard as well, but I always mm -hmm. grew up liking the Solomon Kane side, and I'm always kind of shocked that that one never really picked up. You know, there's been a movie now, and there's been mm -hmm. a couple of things, but like that one never picked up, even though that's pretty much what Van Helsing, like the Van Helsing movie, is. Is basically that's Solomon Kane, but yeah. lighter. Um, uh -huh. And it's just weird that that one never picked up. But Conan has when I always thought Solomon Kane was a much cooler concept. You know, he's basically a hardcore Puritan who goes and kills demons and monsters. Yeah, he was a more well-rounded character. I think one, well, you know, one of the things now, right, as I'm, you know, older and so much more sophisticated, reading, <laughs> reading those stories again, they're tremendous fun and just the writing is so really in your face and it's so action adventure oriented. But as a character, Conan's really pretty terrible. He just, you know, starts every story just wanting to be left alone, has to really be dragged into it. Like the villain has to just insist, like, no, you're going to have to kill me at the end of this. Like, you just have to. And he's like, can I just go and not do this? <laughs> you know, like, that's what most of the stories are him just trying not to be in the story. Um, and then he finally just gets angry enough to, you know, cleave the guy in twain. <laughs> with his mighty battle axe, and then that's the end. So, so is that not how you face most of your problems, or is that just me? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, now, right? It, it's it's hard for me to know if that's why I was drawn to Conan, or Conan did that to me. <laughs> I don't know. It makes me kind I mean, of wonder, though, if Conan living on nowadays, you know, people know who Conan is still. You know, they even tried the Jason Momoa movie not that long ago. If it's because Arnold kind of became that character for many people and it sort of gave it mm -hmm. extra life while, you know, the Solomon Kane movie, which came out a few years ago, James Purfoy is James Purfoy, but he's not really like, yeah. he's not Arnold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'd see, I didn't love the Arnold movies as much as some people did because by that point I was a fan and a purist and just thought, well, he doesn't have blue eyes, so that's it. This, these movies suck. <laughs> I, you know, that I was, was it. That was I the... Was, that guy, I, I'll admit it. I was <laughs> okay. that guy. But you starting, you know, playing Dungeons and Dragons and so on, you know, then you, you know, you, you eventually became a. You worked with TSR, um, mm -hmm. right when uh, I think it was when King switched to a slightly different role, and then that became Wizards of the Coast a couple of years later. You know, mm -hmm. they make <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, and I know, right? So how, how, so how kind of weird was that to suddenly start working for the people that made this game that became that made you who you are you, you know i'm not even going to try to be cool about that that was just the greatest thing uh, you can possibly imagine I, it was really it was really insane um because it kind of came to me a little little bit of a roundabout way first so first of all 
once we started playing D and D for real, like like the first week of high school, that was pretty much all I did. Um, just enough school to get it over with, and D and D like four times a week, <laughs> um, all day on Saturday, at least two days after school, and then whatever extra we could fit in. Um, it was just all that I did to the because, point, which is so crazy to think now. Cause like my D and D group, we have such a hard time meeting up with each other. <laughs> I haven't played D and D in years now, which is just insane. And but, uh, it it's, gets it's Saturday hard. nights for us. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it got to the point where I remember my parents saying, boy, if you spend as much time on your schoolwork as you did on this game, you could have a great career ahead of you. And you know, like, uh, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> then I got the job and I said, see, I was I'm doing nothing but playing d and I got this great career. So, meh. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I had started doing some freelance writing for other game companies. Um, I was big into Traveler at the time and started doing some, some writing for a Traveler and um, Chill by Mayfair Games. Um they were also in suburban Chicago where I lived at the time. And I sent in a proposal for this, you know, sort of crazy idea to TSR and it got passed around. And apparently Jim Ward, who was running the game design with they, you know, what later came to be known as R and D at, at Wizards of the Coast, but this was still a TSR in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, um, liked the idea or somehow just kind of, thought, hey, maybe we just hire this guy in some capacity and then we can just have the idea. <laughs> and then uh, passed my resume to Brian Thompson, who ran the book publishing team, um, who had an opening there because Rob King had decided to leave the company. So thank you, Rob King. Um, and I, he called me in for an interview and I went in, thought I did horribly. Left there going, oh, well. That would have been cool to work there. You know, I really was sure I blew it. But he called me back a few days later, and that was it. I started. That was uh, September of 95. And so by that time, you know, the, the Dungeon & Dragons and the Realms had fully, fully merged by then. Because we've had Greenwood and Grub on, and they talk about the early times. You know, was, for those who don't know, Gr Greenwood... Saw, came up with the realms as a kid and then made that his own like campaign area for Dungeons and Dragons and then eventually TSR decided to make that the official setting for Dungeons and Dragons with Advanced mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons and Greenwood's kind of been like the brainchild of most of that area for a long time um, and mm -hmm. literally he started it as a seven year old so it's, <laughs> it's kind yeah. of like a dream but so you came in there after Advanced Dungeons and Dragons had really set in, and some people claim they understand how Thacko works, I don't, still don't understand how Thacko works. <laughs> yeah, it was the, the in the second edition era that I came in. Yeah, and and those, that was the era that really kind of cemented Dungeons and Dragons in a in a more mainstream way, because that is when we got a lot of the games set in. We got you know the the Baldur's Gates, the Icewind Dales, the um, Neverwinter Nights. Mm -hmm. You know that those games started coming in, and that really brought it to a different audience. Um, and the books really exploded because that's, of course, when, you know, Salvatore got his ones and they're Denning and they, you know, all these books mm -hmm. popped out. And uh, that's you jumped right in there right at the kind of the perfect time just to start running. Right. Right in the middle of right in the middle of things. And just, you know, it, it was definitely a, you know, kind of a top down structure, we'll call it within that team. It was really Brian Thompson's party. And so we were. And I think he, I don't know why exactly, but I think he had a plan for this, you know, just to kind of keep people from getting too specialized or sort of feeling that they had some sense of ownership over anything. Um, he would assign us to books almost at random, so which was good and bad. Um, but I was, it started out editing, um, you know, the TSR books line, which was sort of standalone or, you know, what I guess you would call creator-owned or traditional fantasy novels that were just brought in by individual authors. Also Forgotten Realms, also uh, Ravenloft, also Dragonlance, Match the Gathering. Uh, Birthright. Magic wasn't until two years later when we moved out to Seattle. Okay. 
with wizards. Yeah. But when I first started, I was just all over the map and had to really learn a little bit of everything. How did you keep all these universes in line? Because they're all very different mythology, and their fans are very um, specific mm -hmm. in what they know. Very passionate. Yes, that's a good one. Oh, that's that, the term that, I'm going to use. That's for sure, yeah. But he, remember, I was the guy who hated Arnold Schwarzenegger and Conan because he didn't have blue eyes. So very passionate. I, you know, <laughs> I went in kind of understanding that and, and also went in thinking, I really want to just keep this job. So, you know, sort of my, arch, my marching orders to myself were, you know, shut up and learn and just do the best job you can. And in terms of kind of keeping everything straight, the good news about, you know, working in any of those campaign settings or any of those D&D &D worlds was that someone somewhere along the line had created some kind of uh, campaign setting box set or hardcover there was that source material there. So it's just a question of knowing what you don't know or understanding that you shouldn't just say, oh, this sounds right or it seems like it's okay. And just check everything against those shelf after shelf even then of, uh, you know, game products of, of expansion, um, booklets and adventure modules, everything. And how many and calls did you have to do? Since I, uh, other ones have said they did this, how many calls to Ed did you have to do? Be like, I need to know what goes right here in this corner. It's, it's empty. A bunch <laughs> of times. And I learned really quickly that if you asked Ed a question that, and this became, you know, it, this was even, we didn't even have email when I started. Like we had these ancient old computers that were just, even then were terribly Apple old. Too. So, yeah, I would call him on the phone with the simplest question, and that phone call would be an hour and a half or so. <laughs> and then it would be followed by an envelope from Canada filled with page after page of material that was either he had this in a file, or I asked the question and he said, ooh, they need to know that, <laughs> and just sat down and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And... I had, I left it behind when I left Wizards and and sort of handed it off to Susan Morris, who I don't know who she handed it off to later when she left, but these original Forgotten Realms books that were, that were sort of just photocopies that were bound, um, that were Ed's original notes, and that just had this wealth of information that you just, this brain would just pour world building out um it had articles about how to how people in the realms go to the bathroom <laughs> and i in it's such ex exhausting detail that I, I don't think that dr spock ever wrote a book on potty training that went into this level of exactly how you come out of there clean and ready for action um so i and an and article about undergarments from different parts of the realms I mean, just enormous quantity of literally everything you could think of well as an editor that must make your job a lot easier because like with the realms there's so many books so many different authors with their own little series you have to somehow keep it cohesive and i imagine that really helped keep things a cohesive right. unit well that was so after tsr was bought up by wizards of the coast and a bunch of us made the move out to seattle um the new boss decided that it was would be better and i agreed with her you know that that editors be assigned to a specific line so because there were some that were so big um dragonlance and forgotten realms in particular that you really did need that expertise you really did need somebody who knew what was going on what all the other authors were doing and not just what has been published but what was in the hopper to be published um so just sort of by virtue of being the only guy left, I think, to some degree, um, I took on Forgotten Realms and then just had to immerse myself in it. Wow. And I, I lived in that for the better part of 15 years, like 13 years later. You helped do the editing for, you know, you worked with Salator's Icewind Dale series. You worked with, you even worked with Ed with Elminster and some of the other ones and Troy Denning's ones. A lot of those, that <laughs> series of, that came out in the second and third edition D&D &D time before they 
did things with fourth edition, which were kind right. of perfect. Well, and I was one of the guys who did things with the fourth edition, but that's a whole other. I, I, I just like because we you know we, we um first time I had Salvatore on was the first book of the Sundering, and I knew mm-hmm. he was one of the ones that was kind of grumpy about fourth edition. I know why the change had to happen. Sure. You had, you, uh-huh. you had hundreds of books. You had to do something to change it, and you know, killing gods and so on was was needed. But you know, just hearing he was one of the ones I know that was fairly grumpy about it. But I, I you know, it kept mm-hmm. things going. It kept things going, and sun and then the thundering happened, and kept things interesting again. And it, there's going to be more changes eventually. So it's how it works. Yeah. You can't survive. Yeah, fourth edition. Fourth edition was less about fixing what was wrong with the Forgotten Realms than trying to figure out how to. Put a radical rethink of of D and D into the Forgotten Realms world, and that was really what the big challenge was. Is fourth edition D and D was so radically different in some of the you know sort of basic ways that the way magic worked, even the alignment system, the the sort of cosmos or the planes, etc. Everything was almost everything was completely different. <laughs> and so that meant that some of the basic world building assumptions that, that the realms had been working under since, since Ed first converted it into his homebrew D and D setting in the like mid seventies um, had to be thrown out and re- there was kind of no way to, to say, let's just pretend it's always been like that. Um, there was just too much that was different. So it was just a desperate attempt to try to match these things together. So I have a question from the editing side of things, because, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of uh, authors in the realms, there's some really big authors in there who have really big followings. Um, how much as an editor, what exactly was your role? Say when you take, um, I believe Homecoming is one of the ones that you did, that Salvatore one. Um, when you take mm-hmm. one of those books, you know, it's done by an established author who has a big following. How much control, how much pushback are you allowed to give when it comes to being an editor? Is it pretty much just make sure the book flows and works or are you allowed to actually right. give full pushback to someone with, with clout? Yeah. So I, I, I was sort of expected to push back where necessary, right? The, I th- the biggest part of that job being Forgotten Realms line editor for the, for the novels was first protect that property and don't just let somebody start blowing stuff up and things like that. So when I pushed back, it wasn't just because, hey, make this more like the world I want. Um, it was, I think, you know, I think it really goes to the sort of basic concept is that writing in a shared world universe like that, a shared world, um, the experience for an author, and so therefore the experience for an editor is more like writing historical fiction than fantasy. Um, in the same way that you, if you sit down and you write a book set in Victorian England, and it's not steampunk, it's not meant to be fantasy or an alternate reality, something like that, you really, as an author, you have to do your homework. You have to learn that history. You have to know sort of what technology was available, what sort of, you know, gender roles were common and things like that. Um, You have to understand the history. And writing in the Forgotten Realms had become exactly that. You had to do that historical research. Because it's certainly by the time we got into the, you know, late 90s, so much material had been published, so many books, and so, and game products that got to be titanic in scope. These box sets that, um, you know, some of the 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 or the the Forgotten Realms game team were working on, like guys like Stephen Shen, were creating these enormously complex histories that would go back thousands of years. And so, any little reference that was made in a book had to be double checked against what was essentially the the actual real written history of this world. So it was. I, I had to push back on all sorts of little details from time to time and then just help them write the best book they could, which is really what any editor's number one job is. Just make the story as good a story as it possibly can be. So, you know, then the question is, you know, since I have to get to this eventually, um, you, mm-hmm. you worked for TSR as an editor mm-hmm. and so on, and then you worked for Wizards. How did you feel when you were first a 
approach to write in the realms yourself with your first, I believe, first published one, Baldur's Gate. And then mm -hmm. I was really curious with a game written, uh, done by Bioware, written as sort uh -huh. of a very, it's the, it's, it's the game that made Bioware Bioware um, with Black Isle, you know, with choices right. and so on. What type of support and pushback were you able to even get from them? Because games, you know, change as they go, they write as they go. And a game like that one, which is made like, right. by, by, you know, by player choice, really shows me like there's no way they can make a movie of like Mass Effect because they would offend ninety percent <laughs> of the people because they're going to make a different choice than someone made somewhere or another. Starting right. with gender, maybe. <laughs> you know, you have no idea. Um, so, what sort of help did they get you, and who was helping you edit that one? And what sort of help did Bioware work with you on that on that book? Since I know it came out before you know, anyone really got to play the game, so to speak. Right. So that story is kind of, it's, it's kind of rough looking back, <laughs> looking back on that. Um, and it's almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years this July that that book was first published. Right. So, you know, the fact that this, you know, people are still talking about this really amazes me. I think it's good. Right. But, um, you know, at the same time, I think once, any author gets to a certain point in his career, you you end up with the book they want you want them to remember you for, you know. And I uh, haven't written that yet. You know, we'll see what happens. But and then there's the book that was the most successful, which for me was Annihilation. And then there's the book that you wish would disappear <laughs> from the memory of mankind for all time, to be struck from all obelisks. You know, all all te all temples and and all records from from now until forever, and that would be Baldur's Gate. But you know, it, the one Jeremiah. Well, loves I never said I loved the house. It's just I, I I got it as a kid. I played the game. I actually recently played the game itself. And don't worry, even Drew Carpishan says it's impossible to write that series into a proper book. And you know, he done. tackled yeah. the third one. He's like, it's impossible. You just no way we could have made this into that. It's just it doesn't. And that's why I think I, I'm yeah. assuming that's also why Bioware has never had anyone write a direct novelization of any of their games after that. They did like mm -hmm. spinoffs and side things because you just can't tackle that style of game in a book. It's just you, right. you can't. This is choose your own adventure. Well, and <laughs> yeah, and and that you know I think was where first of all we didn't really know, and by we I mean three people inside the book publishing team including myself, didn't really know anything about what this game was going to be. And someone had described it to me or within my hearing that it was going to be it, nothing like what it ended up to be, that it was going to be basically kind of a fighting game, like you would just run around and fight monsters. And so we thought right away, well, this is going to have to be kind of you know, just hit the sword and sorcery guys fighting monsters with magic thing. Um, don't make it too complex. Um, so you can already tell that we started off with just really bad information. <laughs> so, and it had to be done immediately. So whoever was going to write this had no time at all. So there were five people that were on this list, and I was one of them, and they said write a proposal and here's everything we know about the game, which was a printout. It was actually a hard copy printout of an Excel spreadsheet that ran through paths for each character class. So you could pick sort of fighter, wizard, cleric, etc. And then there would be these side quests and it would say this is sort of an optional thing and then it would show that sort of A-line story through. And they said, don't put your name on it. It's going to be a blind thing. We're going to get, you know, a small committee of people to pick one. So I wrote, I picked a fighter and I kind of wrote through this string of, of things from this like four page Excel spreadsheet and <laughs> mine was picked and they said, okay. So it was I think a couple days before Halloween. And they said, we need this before Christmas, before we go on our Christmas oh, break. Oh boy. And so it was just start typing. And again, I said, well, do I have any more material? Do they have any more material? No. I, they, but they said, but we'll be able to send it to them. And at the time, them was Interplay, um, who was actually publishing the game. I, didn't, I never met or talked to anywhere, anyone from Bioware. 
on that book at all. But they said they're, we're going to get we're going to get feedback from them. So just do the best you can. Then they're going to read it and they're going to help us figure out how it matches up. All right. And I said, okay, is there a playable version of the game then? No. Is there anything like a beta? No. Okay. So, <laughs> so just sit down and type, type, type based on that Excel spreadsheet. And so I finished it, you know, in time on, on deadline, like a good boy and gave it to them. And then at some point, you know, in, in, I want to say the end of January, um, I got an email or somebody told me my boss's boss essentially said, yeah, they said it was fine. And that sentence is all the feedback I ever got wow. from anyone in terms of, so it was, it was, you know, I had an editor, one of, you know, my coworkers and I said, are you getting anything? Are you talking to anybody there? Are you talking to, by then we knew about BioWare. Are you talking to anybody at BioWare? Are you talking to anybody at Interplay? He's like, nope, they won't let me. Wow. Did you get anything written about this? Because I said, there is no way that I just took this Excel sheet and just typed like a madman for two months and it's fine. I mean, that's just, that just didn't compute with my editor's brain, you know? Like, well, where, where are you supposed to go with that? It's fine. It's like, fine. The, it's fine. Like, <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I think I take it was terrible better. I'd be like, okay, then I know I can improve on something, but it's fine. Like, it's like, you fine. think they just at least sent you, I think it was Lucas Chris Jansen who wrote, like, all Bioware games have hundreds of pages of scripts. They'd at least like this, here, here's our script. You know, at least. Never saw a single one. Wow. <laughs> and so... The book was written and edited just sort of, you know, from a, is it a, you know, is everything spelled correctly kind of way, you know, because we didn't really, because we had gotten it's fine, so we didn't want to change anything and then all of a sudden make it not fine with some unknown set of parameters, you know, <laughs> so it was just kind of okay, and I just immediately started to get I want to say the word nervous and that doesn't even begin to write I, I, the panic attacks actually start, like literally oh, no. anxiety disorder stuff started happening right away because I just knew there's no way it's fine. <laughs> How could it possibly be fine? And then finally they sent a, a so the book is done and it's at the printer because there's a whole lead time. It's not yeah. just right this wasn't an ebook or anything like that that then goes for on on sale right away it goes to a printer it goes through this whole process of you know cover art and design and then has to go onto a schedule with uh i think our distributor then was i think it might have been hold sprink whatever a random house and then so it has to go through this whole mill it has to be on the schedule it has to go through sales meetings and conferences you know so there was this enormous lag time of months um, ahead of it, and at some point in there, they sent a beta version of the game, and my editor, who's still a friend of mine, actually, was just at his house last weekend, started playing it and said, oh, man, I don't know. I don't think we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, just don't even tell me, because there's, no, there's nothing that can be done. It can't be called back. There's just no, like, we have to just, just pretend it's fine. He's like, you should, you can try playing this. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so I started playing it, knew right away that a character that was described on that initial spreadsheet as a little girl of like nine or 10 years old, um, turns out not to be a little girl anymore. And there was an option, you can let her come with you or not. That option went away in the game. So like, right, I mean, literally chapter one was wrong. And then the game would crash. And if you played the game, the game would cr the, this version of a sort of pre-beta version of it would crash every time you, as soon as you got to the friendly arms. So essentially immediately, yeah. like you would leave Candlekeep and go to the friendly arms and it would just crash. And so I was never able to play it beyond that. And then, of course, the game came out. Everybody loved it. It was a huge success. Everybody at Wizards was really excited. Oh, this is great. You're, now your book comes out. And it just got it's like, hate. Just hide. I'm going to hide for the next three months. And... Yeah. and it was, you know, all of the reviews that are 
obviously this author never played the game. It's like, oh, you could tell. Like, <laughs> you know, what what there, gave it away? You know, like what, the, 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 the game that did not exist in any form at all that, that I had any access to? Yes, you're right. I, did, I didn't play the game. And, you know, reading negative reviews for any author, they'll always tell you, oh, I have a thick skin and that doesn't bother me. And that's a lie. It bothers me. It really does. It, but it, it bothers you more when you know they're right and that you basically put something out there with your name on it that was a disaster. And then so – but I couldn't go then, you know, 20 years ago and say, they screwed me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but told me that the whole story was different and they, I didn't know any of the stuff that was in there and I was told it was going to be the sort of like – fighting game and it was completely different um that would have just been like yeah whatever man you just were lazy and now you're making excuses so i, I don't know it, but sold like crazy so what what that well, says did they, um but by, by the time the second game came around you know second game is considered one of the is still considered one of the best rpgs ever made and it's literally the game that made bioware into like the storytelling mm -hmm. giant it is with the second book, did they give you any more help, or is it still it's fine? They gave me, said. they gave, yeah, they gave me more help. But then there was still this weird communication bottleneck that I think it really is just corporation to corporation or licensor to licensee. There's a paranoia about too much communication, things being leaked and stuff like that. So. I still didn't have a person at Bioware that I was in communication with, but having gone through that first book and, you know, sort of this kind of personal disaster that it was, my, again, my boss's boss at the time was um, much more on top of it. And so they gave, they gave me a better story brief at that time. I obviously knew a little bit more about, the sort of thing that they were going for. But then I was told by somebody that just that here are the things that they haven't created yet. So you just do it and they'll follow you. And I said, Oh, I bet they won't. <laughs> and they're like, no, they will. We're going to make them do it. So I created some stuff, sent it to them. And they said, Oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And this is wrong. But at least I got feedback. So I said, well, I guess they're not going to just do what I say, <laughs> which is fine. I just like, I just, however it matches up, let me match it up. Um, but they had really radically rethought a lot of, you know, the villain's motivation and stuff like that. So for the second one that I wrote, I had to rewrite it again. So that was actually written twice, pretty much completely. Um, so the, th I think the second one matches the game a little yeah, bit better. Yeah, it matches better. a little better. The, the, I guess the big challenge is if the first book was off because they didn't give you the feedback, you still have to make the second book a sequel to that book, but also match the game, which I guess is a double challenge of. Right. And it was, and still because of the different, and, and this is, again, this isn't anybody's fault and there's no like one person who's the villain of this story, you know, including myself, to be honest, that, you know, there's just a difference in the production schedule. So I was still had to finish that book. It had to go to the printer. It had to go through this giant process before there was any playable version of that. So there, were, I knew there was still going to be some things that were changed, some details that weren't going to match up, and that I was just going to have to suck it but up. At least again. there was a time jump this time, so some things could be smudged over a little yeah. bit, like Emma Wynn versus. Mm -hmm. Oh, look! It's an exact sequel the next day. Oh, she's an adult now. That makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all the right. All of a sudden, she's a completely different person. So yeah, and so it, I, I think you know the so the experience and even the sort of reaction to that second book was a little bit a little bit better. But I think at that point now, Baldur's Gate separately had fans. So the Forgotten Realms fans or the Forgotten Realms readership were kind of silent about those two books and figured ah, those are separate things. They're not like real realms books. Um. And the the fans of the game were kind of, uh, I love this game so much. I'm going to read these anyway, but they're terrible, and you know, I'm going to I'm going to hate them. And you know, then the third one came around, and I just was 
I can't, I can't do it. Like, I can't, I'm not, like, uh, you know, twice bitten, you know, third time really shy. Like, I'm just, I can't do it. And then um, that's where true Drew Carpishin came in and, and took it I from there. Like, having played that third and, expansion, I can't imagine anyone writing a book that would make that, that it doesn't make full sense when you play the game. Um, mm -hmm. It's too big and then kind of rushed. I, I can't imagine writing a book to fit that at all. Now, I could see a book yeah, go for the... They just did the guys who want it now, Beam Dog, I think, just did an expansion that covers in between one and two. I could see that becoming a much mm -hmm. cleaner narrative book if they ever decided to yeah. do it. Then that throwing a ball ever could. Right, and so it was after that where you know we really, you know, with that painful experience, what you know, from then on, there were no more video game novelizations. No Icewind right. Dale, and no, there's no, no Neverwinter, no yeah. Landscape. There was well, there was a there was a Neverwinter Nights um, anthology that kind of blew up on us too. That was the sort of last attempt to kind of try to tie in directly to the game to to somebody else's game. Again, it's just the production schedules just didn't fit. These games are being tweaked right to the very last second, um, and books have to be sent to a printer locked in indeed but after that you did get to write a lot of other books which you know annihilation you got to write yes, a lot of course trilogy so you got to write a lot of guides to help you know you wrote the the guide to um legend of drist which is actually really awesome i, I have that somewhere back there you wrote the guide to writing fantasy and science fiction um not that long ago which Ooh. is fantastic uh, i believe you have a monster a monster guide too about yeah. game, about writing monsters uh um, which is which is really awesome. So, like, I have a question from a uh, a, a listener who actually he's he's trying to get into writing. He's he has a book on Amazon right now, one of their eBooks, and he wants to know when how do you name creatures and characters? Like, he says, I sometimes I just throw a dart at the board and pick up consonants and vowels and see if that kind of sounds coherent. Mm -hmm. But how do you effectively name something? And when do you just have to walk away saying that's a name I'm going to have to go with? That was right. definitely a question I had too. <laughs> yeah, and and you know what? Honestly, that idea of sort of stringing letters together to find something that sounds interesting is just as valid as anything else. I, Yay! Every, <laughs> so every time you just created a D and D character and just called him Sorlon or something like, and, and you're like, oh, that sounds like a fantasy name. I don't know that there are a lot of fantasy authors out there who put too much more thought into it than that. Um, so I teach some online courses with Writer's Digest, and one of them is world building, which we're actually, you know, finishing up this week. And one of the weeks actually is is about geography, but really it's about naming things. And for me, fantasy world building, science fiction world building is pretty much 90% naming stuff. It's there's kind of a set pattern to the way humans organize themselves. So you know, you can get as, as deep into the idea of a feudal society as you want to, but it still has a sort of set pattern of rules. But what makes your world, or what starts to at least make your world different than somebody else's, is what you call stuff, what people call stuff. And then, of course, what you concentrate on, what you focus on, and what's important to your story. So... You know, that naming things, first of all, now Google is your friend. So any name, Google it first. And if it's in Game of Thrones, just move on. <laughs> um, if it's another it, language, just swear word, move on. Ooh, yes. Move on, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. And that's, the, you know, that's that can be a hard one. But you know, like, um, And then the, I think the only thing, if it, if it hits if a hit comes back that it was somebody's World of Warcraft character, it's okay. Because at this point, every combination of letters is somebody's World of Warcraft character. I, that, that's the one thing that you can just, you can say, okay, that's, I, I can ignore that, right? Um, but, you know, and, and there's, I think, all sorts of ways to approach it. So it, it really depends on your world building. Are you building a world that, you know, is sort of very much like medieval, what, England, France, then you would start to use, think about those naming conventions. And how can you tweak those a little bit, simplify them so um, 
you know, an American reading audience knows how to pronounce um, a French name. Like, good luck, right? Um, well, the whole so, generation of people who didn't know how to say Hermione. Right. <laughs> I know. I mean, how many times has J.K. Rowling gotten a question about Hermione? <laughs> yes. Over yes. and over again. Guilty. Absolutely guilty. Uh, at least until the movies came out and everybody was like, oh, my God, I'm so embarrassed. Or just started yelling <laughs> at the movies going, you're oh, saying okay. it wrong. Like, the last Airbender were like, oh, wait, you know, when they yelled at everyone for saying it wrong, because they did. But, like, I imagine people in the first Harry Potter movie were yelling, saying, you're saying it wrong. It's Hermione. <laughs> <laughs> so I have another – oh, let me finish. So I have another one from a, a listener. He said, um, I recently watched your Act of Villainy um, Writer's Digest uh, lesson mm -hmm. um, about – as he said, it's called Breathing Life and Your Antagonist. Um, and he, he says, so I'm having trouble writing a villain for a story. And because it's not going to be a grand scheme, a world-ending story, I'm finding it harder to write something subtle to actually make a villain a villain when it's something small and something more intimate versus grand and kind of the – he has a typo right here – but mm -hmm. world-chewing um, villain who just, see, who just chews scenery. How do you write – make someone a villain villainous mm -hmm. when they're something smaller and more intimate in a, in a fantasy setting? Right. I, you know, honestly, I think that can be actually easier. And and when you're talking about writing fiction, by the way, there's no such thing as easy. It's all hard parts. Everything is, what's the hardest part is like, everything. The hardest part of writing a novel is what you're doing right now. Um, but for me, I think it's, it's, it's much more difficult to wrap your head around. I'm going to, you know, be the master of the world. I'm going to take over complete control of the universe than it is to I'm going to kill this guy for a particular a particular reason, right? One particular person for one particular reason. Or I'm going to steal this thing because of this particular reason. So, you know, the in the guide to writing fantasy and science fiction, I kind of fell back on on definitions of hero and villain. And I use those words. I use hero and villain because I'm kind of this, you know, fan of pulp fiction and sword and sorcery and stuff. So definitely sub in protagonist and antagonist. I don't necessarily mean that every story has to be Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader, you know, where it's it's everybody's role is very firmly delineated. But, you know, a hero is somebody whose motivations you understand and whose methods you find inspirational. So you get why they're doing what they're doing and you think the way they do it is really great. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas a villain is just a, a person whose motivations you understand, but whose methods you find abhorrent. So you get why this villain is doing what he or she is doing, but you don't like the way they're going about okay. it. So those are the things that you really need to think about is, What's the what's the disconnect between, you know, where does that what happens in someone's brain where they think they go from this person has wronged me, I'm going to get a lawyer and sue him to this person has wronged me, I'm going to shoot him in the head and dance on his grave. Right. <laughs> what is that? What's where is that switch thrown that says I have great ideas for how to save you know, Germany from this horrible one-sided armistice and this deep and horrible economic depression. Um, and I'm going to, you know, do it with all these uh, you know, financial reforms and tax reforms and things like that. Or I'm going to be Adolf Hitler and launch the Holocaust in World War II. So, you know, you understand sort of what he went in there trying to accomplish and then just watch in horror as he goes horribly, horribly off the rails. Okay. And that, that really is the difference between the hero and the villain. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, really what writers of genre fiction in particular and horror definitely, fantasy for sure, um, you have to be ready to sort of plumb those depths in yourself and just get into the, the evil that resides within. You know, you got to make friends with that a little bit and that can be hard for a lot of okay. people so uh another one from a listener he wants to know when writing genre 
be it science fiction or fantasy, or reading it, sometimes it's jarring when you have something very real world put in there, be it real world technology, real world creatures, or people. How do you balance using what you know in the real world with something fantastical, and how do you make it fit seamlessly? He says, example, when someone uses the word toilet and have a flusher <laughs> in a science fiction one, it just seems mm -hmm. so odd. Well, that, that oh, okay. Um, I think that would see. I think that would seem odd to me in a fantasy story, right? That that would feel anachronistic. Like, when was that invention created? Is this does this castle have that kind of plumbing available to it? But in science fiction, that's probably a machine that's it works. It does what it's supposed to do. I'm not sure why that would necessarily be jarring. And then, of course, I'm not sure why you would would even have that in your story. <laughs> but, so. I guess there are all sorts of reasons, right? That, you know, just ask Ed Greenwood. He'll give you a 30-page dissertation on go that. To the but... <laughs> I just, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a DD and d session and I'll say something. I'm like, wait, do we have that? Is that a thing that exists in right. this world? And my DM immediately gives us a yes or no, just a quick, hard answer to shut me up. But mm -hmm. for the most part, it's just one of those moments of like, wait, do we have that? Does yeah. that exist here? Yeah. And since he's been playing D&D &D since he could, you know, stand up straight, um, he can usually give me a solid answer. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. It's, you know, the more, I think, the more you learn about history, the more dangerous it can be from a fantasy author standpoint. Because, you know, if you look at the Forgotten Realms, for instance, right, it's, I think everybody thinks of it, and probably rightly so, as this medieval fantasy setting. And then all of the ships are really kind of from the, I would say really the 18th century, like 400 years later or, or 600 years later. Um, and there's just, there's sort of technology that fits in there somehow because an artist thought the wizard would look cool with little glasses on. But when were those invented? Oh, I guess it doesn't really matter. And in the end it doesn't because, you know, Forgotten Realms isn't, Europe. It's not, you know, it's not the real world. And so if you've already got dragons and magic in there, certainly you can say, well, they invented different things at different times, at different Guns speeds. Like, um, cannons. I'm like, oh, yeah. Works. But they yeah. all have British accents. <laughs> only the, only the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> only the bad guys. We, that's one thing we've learned from Star Wars. Only the bad guys. I was guys. about to make a Star Wars joke, but I stopped and, myself. So thank you. <laughs> Have a British accent, and then Princess Leia one third of the time <laughs> for like the first two scenes, and then not again. So, <laughs> and I, I rewatched that not that long ago, and I was like, "Oh my god, how did I she never know?" She was part of the Imperial Senate, before. and then she left, and she suddenly lost her Imperial accent. Right, I, I, I've got my VHS <laughs> right here. <laughs> She was kidnapped and, and held prisoner at the Death Star. She's like, oh, no, I'm talking like all of these evil people. I got, <laughs> I got, my accent. I've got so I'd, a so I'd be, we We're almost out of time, but I'd be remiss if I did not you know, touch on another subject because you, you worked with Forgotten Realms heavily, and then you and many other Realms authors kind of not really jumped ship but because it's still Wizards of the Coast, but then you jumped to Wizards' other mm -hmm. giant book series that they did for a while then they decided to stop writing books in it when you jumped to magic the gathering and mm -hmm. you did the giant arc of the weatherlight and the tempest all the way through to annihilation which king did a lot of it robert king or bob king um he did a lot of it mm -hmm. but you helped write some of the short stories and I, I believe you helped do some of the editing as well but what what was it like jumping from the realms to a very different but so, same time similar fantasy setting but this time they have airships and they have mm -hmm. you know automons and right. you know, things like that so through most of the time i didn't really i only sort of worked on the last sort of few magic novels right at the sort of end of my tenure at at wizards and i wrote a few stories um one of which i really thought was terrible and, and I wish that I had done a better job and one that I thought was pretty good and one that I'm really happy with, the one from Secrets of Magic, I thought, you know, really worked. But there were some difficulties with magic as well because of organized play in particular. There was a lot of things that the magic team, when a new set was being developed, really wanted to keep inside and didn't want to you know, get the companion people talking about until they were ready to, you know, sort of introduce that and, and announce that in, in, you know, whatever controlled way they could. 
So it was another sort of books written too quickly, um, books written without all the information we wish we, we could have had. Also, Magic never really had that wealth of background information written somewhere. They didn't have a campaign setting kind of thing that you could go back and and say, well, this has been published, and this is so. This is mm -hmm. true, and we have to cleave you to that idea. Little quotes in the bottom of every card doesn't give you full background on everything that you need to do. It, weirdly, <laughs> no. <laughs> it kind of doesn't, especially since those were written per card. You know that that it was only you know kind of later that one person was brought in to sort of really be the story. You know, the story guy, and. You know, he, he definitely started to, you know, to wrangle that a lot better. But even then, so much was kind of created on the fly, and each set was a different world, which was part of the way magic works, which was really interesting and made it cool, and made each of those releases really fresh and really interesting, was also what kind of made it very, very difficult to to sort of match that with books. And again, everybody's production schedule is different and I, these books had to be done so far ahead of time. And, you know, so it was, it was terribly difficult. And so a lot of the magic novels were written by, you know, a few authors that we knew could just deliver something really, really fast. So some of those were written in, in a wow. few weeks. Yeah, because wow. like one thing I really impressed me about, you know, I, I read everyone, I read a, a random ones, but I did read everyone from Wrath and Storm, the anthology which you wrote, uh, one of the stories of, all mm -hmm. the way through Apocalypse. Um, most of those were written by um, by King, but you know, one thing that really impressed me was, you know, like they tried really hard to tie it in with like the earlier like artifact books by Jeff Grubb, you know, Brothers War and so on, and they mm -hmm. they, they tied it in pretty well. But I think one thing that I appreciated about the Magic, at least that main series, was they could focus on one branch of characters throughout and have them bounce around. While well, Forgotten Realms, you had to like, right. okay, do I like, okay, the Salvatore ones, I know that character. Okay, I know Kemp will have these characters. You know, which characters do you want to follow versus I'm going to read everything Forgotten Realms because it would, if you read everything at one time, it's mm -hmm. kind of just like, I don't know what's happening anymore because it could be almost any era. Well, that yeah. one at least tried to like have a through stream through it. And then after that, they kind of, mm -hmm. well, nowadays they don't make any of them anymore. Which yeah. Is sad. Well, there was the idea originally, and I think with Brothers War was there's sort of a set of characters, just like you said, that we're going to sort of follow through from plane to plane, or to give the the whole idea of magic this kind of bigger frame global framing story. And so then each of the sets that come out are going to show you another plane, basically. Um, and yeah, then the the book started to match the the set releases and that was got got much harder because they had to be contained just to that world and they had to be kind of written at the same time that world was being created but the good news there at least was you know unlike Baldur's Gate we didn't just get that's fine <laughs> we, we said, because and there wasn't a you know sort of companies in between other companies and things no, like that <laughs> Yeah, we could walk it to the person and sit in a meeting with a person who literally was in a cubicle, you know, within throwing distance of us and say, okay, read this because you're going to, you know, and they understood our schedules and we said, this is, we need you to give us notes on this and we're going to do whatever you tell us to do, but this is the deadline, right? And so we would get detailed stuff back from them, detailed feedback of, you know, sort of this concept was altered a little bit in this way and and so you know we would all work or the the magic line editors who was mostly not me would work really hard to you know make sure that all those corrections were done um and that we just got the best shot at and it and the advantage is you have visuals but that's another one visuals painted that they can yeah. just look at right and that was the thing that they also they did have too was a style guide for each of those sets that had art and that had sketches and had at least little sort of bits of information about the different creatures and, and other concepts and and uh, settings that were introduced. So there was at least a little bit, not you know anywhere near the wealth of detail that you would get from some of those gigantic uh, Forgotten Realms box sets and stuff. Um, but at least there was something that we were all a common document that we were all working from. Okay. 
And then uh, I know you left, I believe you left in 2010. Um, mm-hmm. So what, what do you do now? I, I, I know you help teach people. You have your blog, which in your guide to right. fantasy writing, which you answer people's questions, which is very useful going through all those. But like, what, what do you do as your job now? Um, I'm a really, I sort of split. I'm kind of 50, 50. I teach writing um, online. I do conferences as well. Um, and I write books on writing. I'm sort of working on a couple of those concurrently right now um, that I can't really talk about yet. But I also am a freelance editor, so I'm working with sort of both corporate or sort of publisher clients and then individual independent authors, just people who are are self-publishing and people who are, um, you know, sort of looking to take their writing to that next level. And I work as a as a writing coach as well. So I'm kind of just out here on my own, just doing a lot of, of interesting stuff. Kind of a, an, a new challenge to, you know, after editing the realms and like Magic the Gathering and so on, where you have this set universe and set rules. And by then you became an expert mm-hmm. on, you know, a, a lot of it, even though it was kind of ever changing, but you became an expert on where things were. Is it an extra challenge now to edit fantasy books, but you don't have the restraint of a set universe where you're like a historian right. going, that doesn't fetch, that doesn't match when this God died, you need to change it now. No, to be honest, it's way easier. <laughs> it really is. It's way easier. And and I think that, that that is kind of opposite what a lot of people assume. That, you know, and I dealt with that for 15 years working for, you know, TSR and then Wizards was the sense of, oh, that's just like fan fiction and that's just like crap. And, you know, that's thrown together really fast. Although I've now told you stories of things that were thrown <laughs> together really fast, and, you know, without this nearly the care that was necessary. Those were the weird every once in a while outliers. I'm happy to report the rest of it was, you know, was crafted very, very carefully by people who cared really, really a lot about what they were doing. Um, and for every little bit of of sort of realms lore that that I got wrong or you know let slip through, um, you have no idea the mountains of of detail work that went into each and every single one of those books and the, and authors too, kind of going in thinking, oh, this is going to be kind of easy because all the world building is like done for me and I'll just, you know, concentrate on the characters. But again, it's like writing a historical novel. You can't just make an assumption about what's best for your story right now. So we'll just go with that. Um, every little bit has to be vetted and it could be, extremely difficult still the hardest i've ever worked on my life was the war of the spider queen series it was just two years of of or more of hard labor just to make sure that every little bit was correct and still some goofy stuff slipped through i mean the occasional little mistakes slipped through that um that was that was hard but now you know i'm getting a fantasy novel from an author who's created their own world created their own characters, has a story to tell. Then it's really about working with that author individually to say, you know what, this one, I'm not sure this is as original as you think, you know, <laughs> look at the world building and, you know, let's kind of tweak this here, tweak that there. But I, I don't have some authority to go back and say, okay, but it's right here in this box set that says this that happened and that happened. And so you can't just do this. It's like, uh, you can do whatever you want, right? Let's just make sure that the it's the best story you can possibly tell. Just make tell. sure there's no talking lion Jesus and orcs and um, random uh, airships called the Netherlight. <laughs> hey, <Right>. hey, talking <laughs> lion, talking lion Jesus is the only fantasy I was allowed as a kid. Let me have this. <laughs> it, it, it is no, one of the I, most influential ever, me. so we'll, we'll we'll go with it. When I told uh, my D&D group I was uh, going to help interview you today, my DM was like, oh, my God, War of the Spider Queen. I love that so much. So you're, you're up, you've got fans out here oh, thanks. all the way up yeah. in Alaska. That, um, was just, that was hard. That was just really hard. Um, but it was worth it. I was really happy with the way that turned out just on every, every bit having, of it. Oh. So yeah. one question I had – sorry, Jared. One question I had for you was um, – so I've never I've never had a book published with my name on it or anything, but I was on the cover of a book once as a like the picture, and I flipped the first time I saw it in a store. Like mm-hmm. I got excited, started walking around the store, 
po- telling complete strangers that that was me. There's a video of it, and it's very embarrassing. So, uh, seeing your name on the on a book on a shelf in a public place for the first time, what was that like for you? It was it was really super cool. I wish it wasn't Baldur's Gate, but <laughs> it, was, it was you know because I already kind of had a a sort of set of mixed feelings about that, and I think it may have been different for me at that point because. I had been working in publishing, so, you know, for a while then. And so it got to be where, you know, I saw my Forgotten Realms books with the rest of the Forgotten Realms. And I just thought, you know, this is just like me and my friends doing our thing. And, you know, that, I think that's actually kind of better. And and, and in a way, I think that that definitely helped me. And, and also, you know, sort of going through what I went through with Baldur's Gate, really prevented that ego thing of, well, that's it now, you know, I'm awesome. Look at how great I am. I'm like the author of the great book, you know? And, and so it was, it was hard from, it was cool to see. And, and, and in, in retrospect, I I can't say I would have changed anything. You know, I would have fought harder to get to somebody at BioWare to, you know, (laughs) and, uh, and I would have fought, harder to do a better job. I, I hope I would have, would have done that, but, um, you know, it was, it was kind of a way to ease in that, you know, not everybody can experience. So I have one last question and then I don't know if that's uh, you know, for Kayla, but you know, I, I have, you know, you worked as an editor mm-hmm. through forgotten realms for quite a while with a lot of the classic authors. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of got a lot of the newer one, the next generation in there, uh, like the, like mm-hmm. Kemp's and so on. Um, so my, my my question is though, now on the outside looking in, are you surprised that the realms is still rolling the way it is? Like you know, for example, we talked to Salvatore and he said he was getting a little tired when he did his Sundering book and he was going to end soon. And now he's just like, no, I'm good. I have a second wind. I'm still I'm still rolling. You know, Greenwood is. Mm-hmm. You know, he hasn't written as much, but you know, he's. I mean, we talked to him last year actually. I think the second time. But you know, and he's still there. He's still creating things. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's just a little sad that they're raking less books than they used to, you know, slowing down that one. But are you still surprised that this generation, that the Mm -hmm. old guard is coming back, Denning came back, and so on, and that the new guard is just still rolling? Uh, No, I'm not surprised by that at all. I think that's, you know, and that's the thing, too, because, you know, coming in, and you had said before that I came in 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 95, so I didn't create the Forgotten Realms. I didn't, you know, that was, it was they're waiting for me <laughs> it was successful already and so it was my job and i and you know knowing that going in that i didn't own this thing this wasn't mine uh to keep i saw myself the whole time as sort of this is it's up to me now i've been hired to be the temporary steward of this thing and just try not to destroy it if you can you know that was kind of that that was really my job was to protect it as best I could, um, you know, and and I think I did a pretty good job of that, even once we got to fourth edition and, and things got farther out of my control. I'm definitely disappointed that the publishing program didn't continue and is it's gone completely as far as I can tell. Um, that, was, that was definitely disappointing. A lot of my, the last few years of my time there was just you know, desperately trying to keep it going. Um, when the company really felt like it apparently wanted to move on, <laughs> you know, wasn't, wasn't really willing to just say that. Like, we're just deciding, we, we've decided not to do this. We're just hoping, it was almost like, you know, people who don't want to break up with their significant other, so they just start acting like a jerk and hope that the other person will break up with them. Um, that's kind of what it felt like for me the last couple of years I was there. Um, and that's, I think that's too bad because there were, there's a lot of stories in the realms that can still be told. And a lot of authors who are ready, willing, and able to, to keep that torch burning and to come back in, you know, and, and leave for a while, come back in, you know, things like that. And there are new authors out there who could have had, you know, careers established the same way that, you know, R.A. Salvatore did and, um, you know, Paul Kemp has and move on to, you know, doing other other things on their own. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's too bad. But, you know, again, the, whoever is there now, it's their turn 
to figure stuff out. And, you know, they're I'm doing some really interesting stuff with board games and things like that. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh-huh. So, Kayla, do you have any last questions before we wrap this up? Yeah, I had one more. So you've gotten to work with so many incredible writers and people over the years, but if you got a email notification tomorrow that just like made your heart jump out of your chest because somebody, a writer or um, somebody wanted to work with you, who would that email be from? Oh boy. Um, no, probably no one who's alive anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what about Michael Morton? Is it just that? Okay. Um, love Michael Morton. I think he's still alive. We had him love. on the show, but I think he's still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! I was the biggest fan of the whole Elric. Okay, this is I, a fictional I, I, question. They can be emailed from the beyond. Harlan Ellison was the the author that made me want to really write. And when I was a little kid, as soon as I, like, first grade, as soon as they taught me how to write, I was writing my little books and little comic books and stuff. Um, and I just thought this is, you know, once I kind of, you, you, as a little kid, you grapple with the idea that somebody wrote this thing. You know, there was a person who just sat down and thought it up. And that idea of, like, well, I could be a grown-up and my job would be to think up stories and science fiction stories. Like, where do I sign up? You know, and I'm, I mean like five-year-old Phil is like, all right, that's what I'm doing. You know, well, he wanted to be an astronaut, but then, you know, short of that, then I'll then write science fiction books. <laughs> and, you know, right. Um, and, but it was, you know, as a teenager reading a particular story by Harlan Ellison that just, uh, where I thought that, no, I'm, I'm going to do this. Like, this is it right there. Um, and I got a chance to interview him a couple times. I've talked to him on the phone. He yelled at me a couple times, which was the greatest thing ever. <laughs> I yelled at by Harlan Ellison. To me, it was just like, this is the dream come true. I don't I don't need him to be my friend. Just yell at me. Like, disapprove of something I just said. You were yell. calling him at like 3 in the morning going, I just wanted to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't stalkery. It was just like, he just liked that. It's kind of how he communicated. You know, he kind of you know, communicated that way. But... You know, he was an imperfect human, but the greatest short story writer of all time. One of my guy friends has a cease and desist from Lucasfilm, and he sees it very much the same way of like, they know me. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me my own restraining order. They sent me a letter. And he immediately de- ceased and desisted, but still he's got the letter like in his house. He's like, look. He's praying the <laughs> I would have been tempted to open the envelope. It's like that my restraining order from Lucasfilm is mint in box. <laughs> but this was... This was before um, Darth Mouse took over, so was, this is a very pure <laughs> this is from Lucas Film Limited. Uh, <laughs> well, this has been fun. So, yeah, yeah it has been. And I hope it wasn't too glum at the end, you know, sounding like, oh, they were terrible to me. It was the coast because, you know, it was 15 years of 99 percent great. Yeah, no, it, I didn't think it sounded that, that, that glum. It, you, you were there during the era where my entire generation got got into all of that. Like, it, you know, Magic mm-hmm. started in '93. You know, so you got mm-hmm. there when Magic was picking up. Dungeons and Dragons was roll. Well, you know, was already was was uh, was rolling. Was say, um, you know, thir- third and a half, yeah. you know, three uh, three point five. I think it started sometime in the '90s. And mm-hmm. then you know, Forgotten Realms. Yeah. You know, th- those series were already there, and people were finding them. Bookstores are actually existing. Borders and Waldens and so on still existed, so it was it was an awesome era to be working mm-hmm. in book publishing. Now, it's a it's a very different era. It's a very different time, and uh, it's for a new generation of people. Yeah, it, it is. And you know, I think it's interesting, to sort of, to see the way the business evolved too. That you know, we came. I started at TSR as that company was starting, unbeknownst to literally everyone who worked there, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> was starting to disintegrate and, you know, got to the point where we had stopped publishing anything and we went months at a time just sort of waiting to be fired. Like, just would, I would come in in the morning and if my key card opened the door, then I was like, well, I'm working today. It it was really, really, really strange. We had stopped working and basically just kind of sat around all day waiting for somebody to tell us we're out of business. And then... You know, Peter Atkinson, the great hero 
just, I mean, he is, will always be my hero. Just swooped in and, and saved us all and, and brought us out to Seattle, which I love. Um, and I've stayed here and, you know, just breathed so much life into everything. It was right after we came out to uh, Seattle in the summer of 97 that right away work on third edition began then. Nice. Um, and he was just committed to, and he basically said, I don't care how much it costs, just get stuff moving again, right? If you need to completely retool something, completely retool it, do what you got to do. And right away, books that were sitting in the can were coming out again, and we just started publishing again. And it went, and third edition was a tremendous success that just pushed everything, you know, up into the stratosphere. We brought Bob Salvatore back into the fold. He had had a falling out with TSR. Um, and, you know, his books were showing up in the kind of in the 20s on the extended New York Times bestseller list. And I think it was the Pirate King that debuted yep. at number three. So, you know, his books just went into a, a whole other next level thing. For a while there, we were selling 35,000 copies of the Crystal Shard every year. And that was a book that was already 20 years old. Um, so, yeah, there was some, it was a tremendous period of success. And all the way through, you know, the Hasbro buyout and stuff like that. Bookstores well, a lot of, a, 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 this, this shelf is Forgotten Realms. Yeah. Yeah. Say a lot of great companies went through things like that, like Marvel Comics themselves. Like they, there was an interview with some of their artists uh, from the late '90s, early 2000s, where they said they'd come to work and see their desks and file cabinets just going out the door, mm -hmm. and they were like, "Do I have a job still?" And they, they oh. very much the same way of like, they'd show up and they'd be like, "I hope the key works." Like, here we go. So and after at, the, at, at the 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 now, yeah, at TSR in Lake Geneva, after I think it was the third day where there was no toilet paper. Um, my, one of my coworkers, the editor, um, Bill Larson, walked over to the supermarket that was right behind the building in, in Lake Geneva and bought some toilet paper for the men's room in, in, the, <laughs> in the building. And then the Lions Club came and took their gumball machine. Oh, no. And the, the service that, that took care of all the plants that were scattered around the building came in with a big cart and took the plants away. And it was just really, we're sitting in our offices just watching this cart full of plants being taken away. And we're like, does that mean something? And all of our bosses were told to tell us nothing. It's like, um, no. Uh. And then, you know, because every month they would come by with it, someone would come by with a big cart full of everything that the company published that month. And everyone would get a copy of it. So every book and every, you know, game product, everything. And then one month went by where that didn't happen. And we were told there was a problem with the printer. Oh, okay. But it's good. It's going to be resolved. And then the next month, no, nothing. Right. Finally, they had to say, well, right now we're kind of suspending stuff, but we're working on it. There's a problem with the printer. <laughs> the problem with the printer was that the printer wanted the to get paid. The printer's jammed. It's a massive paper jam. It can't come up. Staples are in there. Oh, I just, I, I can't well, imagine how surreal that is to just be sitting there and be like, am I dreaming that these things are happening right now? Because while they're not a huge impact, it's a big difference. Uh-huh. I can't yeah. imagine. <laughs> I just can't. Psychologically, it really worked at people because I just thought, what, no, like, what am I going to do, right? I'm, you know, what job am I going to get after this? That's going to be anywhere that's near this cool. That's when the lights call. go out and you go, um, uh, whoops. Yeah, like, should we have left? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it really felt like, did they just not tell us that we're out of business? And then, you know, but we kept getting paychecks and the keys still open the doors, and so I just thought, just going and then, it was, then i had to go home and tell my wife what do you think about seattle have you ever, have you ever thought of and she's a you know uh born and raised chicagoan and thought i you know i have no reason fraser is set there you know <laughs> fraser was on at the time that was it but we just get got in the car and literally drove from chicago to seattle that's how most people ended up in Alaska. So uh, <laughs> that's how both my parents ended up here. It's like, I guess we'll go to Alaska now. And yeah, my the mom's job in New Zealand, was. and my yeah, dad is like, like, "Want to go to Alaska?" And she's like, um, "No, not really." 
Well, I'm going there. I guess I'm going there, too. <laughs> That's kind of going from pole to pole. That's yeah, a big, why not? That's a big, even bigger move than Chicago to Seattle. It seemed okay. pretty big. I'm actually um, going to be in Chicago for the first time in April, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, yeah. We're going for Star Wars Celebration um, mm. because it's in Chicago this time, and we were debating on whether or not we were going to go, and then it was in Chicago, and my husband had only been there temp like for like a day, so we were like, okay, we have to go to Chicago. So I'm really excited to go check out your old stomping grounds. <laughs> I still, you know, the only thing I miss, I've been here 20 years. The only thing I still miss really is the food. That's like, what everyone says. Just, everyone the says food the is food. Really good. It is where, in Wisconsin. It is where pizza that. was perfected. Oh, uh, I, and Don't I, listen to New Yorkers. I'm such a snob when it comes to pizza. So I think I'm going to uh, enjoy this. Yeah, yeah. My, my wife's nodding. That says pizza in Chicago pizza. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, but thank you so much. This is awesome, and we we love all yes, this. Thank stories, you for your time. Even that little no, um, coda at the end was even <laughs> was great. Yay! <laughs> well, thanks, now man. now we know because everyone thanks. who's I know, I've talked to a lot of people who work for TSR. You know, even like Kevin Anderson. I think he did a lot of the stories for them, or like the gaming stuff. And all they they they've just said the good things, and then they, I think it was salutary to said, and then I worked for Wizards of the Coast, and he did skip. A yeah. few years. And then it just kind of happened. <laughs> you know, like, things just kind of happened. But if you know? uh, people want to ask you more questions, follow up on your work, or see what you're up to, you know, when you can actually talk about it, where, sh where do you want them to go? Well, you can always find me on Twitter. I'm sort of one of the last holdouts there. It's at Phil Athens. So just P H I L A T H A N S. Um, and then at Fantasy Authors Handbook, which is my blog, that's updated every Tuesday, really talks about writing in general, but fantasy, science fiction, and horror in particular. Um, and that's uh, fantasyhandbook.wordpress.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, this has been an honor. It's great. I, lo I love talking these stories, and I've, especially someone who I've actually read a lot of the work of, including the ones you might not want okay. to be read, but I've read it all, so... I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> now you can now you can have a ritual burning of your copy Someone of Someone made money Gate. on it. Oh Hopefully no. You. And come circle. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much and I will definitely uh, tag you on Twitter and send this to your email as soon as it goes live, okay? Fantastic. Have a good day. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yep. Okay, so Philip Athens, he's one that you you didn't know before. Uh, but I think you I knew of. I knew of, I guess would be the best way to put it. You haven't read tons and tons of tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of fantasy novels. I have, but not these ones, and not nearly as much as you. I can't keep up. There's My no way. My brothers owned all these books, and so I read them all once they got through. Yeah, them. you had a 17-year head start yeah. on me. <laughs> I didn't start getting into fantasy stuff or comic book stuff or any of that stuff till after I moved out, so that's... Uh... You have a bit of a jump on me, and I'm trying to make up for That's it, I swear. That's where you should have bought in the, the HP Lovecraft stuff and brought it home when you were in high school. Your parents would have loved oh, it. Oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> no. Oh, my God. I can't but, imagine the fallout from that. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I love hearing his stories. And those TSR stories, I've never had anyone share those with me. And I've talked to tons of people who work for TSR. Great to have them, finally. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad we got an answer about Baldur's Gate, because that's what I suspected happened. But... And also makes sense why they haven't tried adapting other ones since. Because you imagine, like I know they've talked about a Mass Effect movie for so long, but can you imagine how how impossible would it be to write that? It, you would have to be really picky about it, and I by that I mean like you'd have to pick one very specific storyline and literally and only focus on that one a lot of the, little some of the thing. characters. You'd have to combine characters, you'd have to exercise plot. Like there's no way you could do it because unless you want to do it like um, Andersen style, with we'll choose your own adventure, but. You could, but it would, it would, it would, uh, the video games would outdo then, it easily. I mean, it, it, it could be done, but like, <laughs> back on D&D, &D, do we remember that a Dungeons and Dragons movie? Do we remember that? Like, Do you pick Male Shep or Femme Shep? One is played more, one is more, rec one is more, um, like, critically acclaimed. Like, that's going to divide people automatically. That's, which gender do you pick? Is he making mm -hmm. twins? No, it could be done, but I don't know that it would be worth it. But uh, yeah, I, I loved hearing his stories and and so on. And you know, from uh, at least one listener, welcome back. 
One listener what? has been saying you haven't been on the show for so long, and they're like, you haven't been here oh, for so long. Like, Will she die? Did she go away? I was like, what did I get? I thought I thought my I thought I accidentally signed out of Skype or something. I was like, wait, what happened? Oh, I thought you were gone. Yes. Forever. Oh no, 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 just just busy, busy, busy. Theater stuff and school stuff and earth yes. shaking stuff. Yes, uh, I'm sure everyone's aware, but we had a seven point something earthquake here in Anchorage while I was at work. And um, the walls of my office were moving so quickly that they were cracking and popping and were shooting drywall across the room. And um, the thing I remember mostly about it is we were uh, running out of our building because our safety person for our floor told us to get out of our building. And when we were running out, I remember stepping where there was ground a moment before and then the ground not being there because it was flexing so much. It was crazy and I do not wish to ever experience it ever again. That's why I've I've hit the the point of the aftershocks where it's like aftershocks, yeah, I've been through some of those. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm I am over it. Yeah, we're in like three, four thousand at this point, and some of them have been real big. Uh, my favorite was the one that happened right as I was shutting my front door and the whole building shook. And I was like, did, how hard did I shut that <laughs> door? Um, but yes, theater things, school things, life things, and big old earthquakes. But don't worry, folks. <laughs> She'll be back in a couple of weeks as we have a voice actress um, who's going to be on the show. Uh, yes, we do. Naomi Mercer McKell. Yes, we do. If you don't know how it is, look her yes. up. She's worked with a lot of things. And she'll be on in just a couple of weeks, um, among other among other guests. And in the meantime, uh, in the off week when you're not here, we also have um, uh, another Friedman. You know, we've had Brent Friedman, the author. We've had Crispin Friedman. Now we have David, or sorry, now we have Dan Friedman, who is he does voice acting, but he's mostly known as a sound engineer. He's the one who helps the voice actors sound good, and he's also written books about voice acting from the engineer's perspective. You know, things you can do to help make their job easier. Probably not dancing around the room. Um, it's probably one of them. But, you know, he, he'll be on. Well, gosh <laughs> darn it. Don't, I've been doing it wrong this entire don't time. Some people are. At least don't hit the microphone. <laughs> hmm. Oh, man. I'm doing so many things <laughs> wrong. But he'll be on. And so we have a lot of guests coming up. But, uh, yeah. If you need to uh, email the show or anything like that, you could send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter. We'd love to have your comments, uh, suggestions. If you're also if you're listening on YouTube, leave a comment there. I did get the comment that uh, listener, yes, I do understand you want David Hader, and yes, I am working on that. And believe me, I have worked on that for quite a while. Um, I, mm -hmm. That that I, I'm aiming to make that happen eventually. So don't worry, we're working on. And just as a general comment, it's really nice how cool most people are about us reaching out to them very rarely do we get uh, somebody saying like get lost nerds yeah. usually it's either like a yes or a not right now or no thank you it's always very respectful most of the time so like thanks to thank you to even the people who can't come on the show because for the most part they're a respectful bunch we have to bug them for years through pregnancy and then babies being born before they're finally on but they're always nice about it i feel i feel like that was a specific Call out there, Jerry. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> it's a great interview. But, uh, All right. Thank you so much uh, for joining me today, Kay. And uh, thank you, Phil, or Philip Athens, for joining us and sharing us your stories about TSR, Magic the Gathering, yeah. uh, Dungeons & Dragons, Forgotten Realms, Wizards of the Coast, working in general.